Timeless Can, the podcast with radio personality Jane Lindley Thomas and psychologist Paul Bushell. Because every act of kindness, no matter how big or small, can change lives. In this series, Jane and Paul hope to enrich your life by giving you practical tools on how to be kinder in your relationships with yourself, with those around you, at home, work and in your community. Hi, I'm Jane Lindley Thomas. My name is Paul Bushell. We're here to present the Kindness Can podcast series. Jane and I have started a movement called Kindness Can where we hope to bring kindness to the world. I think sometimes kind is such a simple word, yet it can be so powerful in changing everything around us. So in episode one, what we wanted to chat about was uh, kindness with self. And it's, it's really quite an amazing thing because... If I look at the stories that I've covered in the last couple of years at East Coast Radio, two things stand out for me. Number one, how incredibly kind our community is. Uh, You know, we ask for food, we get 25 tons. If we ask for water, we get so much water that we have to literally say, we've got too much water. So that for me is the capacity in which people can love other people and be so extremely kind. And then you flip it on its head and you say, well... How much of that kindness do you steer in the direction of yourself? You know, what's amazing for me, Jane, uh, through my work as a psychologist, is when you raise this idea of of being in a relationship with yourself uh, or being kind or unkind to yourself, people kind of give you this deadpan look like, what do you mean I'm in a relationship with myself? And that's kind of where, where we're at, is that we don't even imagine ourselves being in a relationship with ourselves, and we can't even sometimes imagine how we are kind or unkind to ourselves. So I think it's really important to be having this conversation today about, yeah, how do we be kinder to ourselves? How do we be kinder in that relationship that we are in with ourselves? So let's talk about our brain and its kind of uh, role. Yeah. So... I'm going to wow, wow people again with the statement. You are not your brain. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Your brain is just like any other part of your body, like your lungs or your heart. It just kind of ticks over and its sole purpose is to keep you alive. And in the process of, of doing that, it can start to form unhealthy habits and it can also want to gravitate towards the negative Uh, kind of preempting hard things so you don't get stuck into them and really holding on and remembering things from the past so you don't repeat them. And thank goodness it does that because it helps us stay alive. But in the process of that, we can also get mixed up and start holding on to things which are not necessarily true or useful or kind. Well, it, it can be quite exhausting because, you know, you start creating this case study where your factory setting is a negativity bias. So even like from the get-go of your day, you're kind of fighting to stay in the light. Yeah. And while your brain is doing this and it's attempts to keep you alive, it starts to initiate these fight or flight type responses in your body. So when your brain catches on uh, to a negative thought about the past or the future, it starts to release cortisol, uh, which is the, the stress thing inside of us. And then our body starts to respond to that as well. So we start to feel physically anxious and, and nervous. And then our brain starts to search for even more reasons. Well, why am I having this feeling right now? And then we get sucked into this loop mm. um, of yeah, a lot of negative thoughts. Well, I mean, I took that negative thought and you know, really enhanced it and made it become a, a real manifestation physically for myself. Yeah. Uh, when I found out that I was pregnant with Rocco and Lula, Cooper was not even two yet. And I remember in that moment almost programming myself to that fight or flight. And fast forward two years, I had manifested, which I didn't know at the time, I had manifested um, a physical pain which harbored itself in my left shoulder and the pain was so bad and so persistent and so real for me that it would lock my jaw on really bad days it would run into my clavicle into into my neck Um, I wasn't able to drive I wasn't able to jump into the swimming pool with my children I wasn't able to look over my shoulder I wasn't able to sleep Um, and this pain was very very real for me So I went on this quest to try and obviously get rid of the pain and it was everything from you know, injections, to chiropractics, to acupuncture, to a neurosurgeon. 
to uh, another um, mammogram, to an MRI scan, and oh, I just this pain just persisted and persisted, and I just I, I got locked in this gridlock of pain. And the last kind of shot at the cherry, so to speak, was to book myself into Entebbe Hospital and have a shoulder up. And I remember begging Dr. Osman, the orthopedic surgeon, the day before the op, saying, please, this is my only option. I cannot live like this. I've got three small children. I cannot live like this any longer. And I had this shoulder up, and he came around on his hospital rounds after the op, and I said, so, Dr. Osman, how was it? And he just looked at me, and he's like, Jane, there wasn't even inflammation mm. on the shoulder. Mm. There was nothing yeah. there. And I realized that I wasn't playing in a medical space, that I was playing in an emotional space. And I had taken all this, the scared feelings of overwhelm and fear and living in a small home and being a freelance. And at some stages, Mikey being unemployed and how are we going to look after three children? How are we going to get a bigger home? And how are we going to get, get a bigger car? And how are we going to afford nappies and how was Cooper going to deal with being one of three children and on and on in the cycle I went until I realized that it wasn't medical that I needed to deal with my emotions. Yeah, so thoughts lead to feelings, right? So we're having these these really scary thoughts over and over again, uh, many of which aren't true or useful or kind, but we're having them anyway mm. and, and we're playing, ruminating with them over and mm. over again. And stewing. Stewing. In oh. them. And those thoughts become our feelings, feelings of anxiety, worry, self-doubt, self-blame. And feelings carry energy. They carry yeah, real energy. And I'm not just meaning this in an esoteric kind of way. You know, they carry weight. Mm. And if we don't express them in healthy ways or process them in healthy ways, it's so easy for them to become locked inside of us. And I mm. think that story probably resonates with so many people out there that their body starts to to manifest and show the cracks and the damage of these thoughts and these feelings which keep going around on a loop. Yeah, I mean, it may be persistent migraines yeah. or a sore lower back or a really sore stomach. You know, as Paul's saying, they do show up as different things. And I mean, it's been amazing because since I started playing in the emotional space and not gravitating to what you would call the wooden fire escape and actually like dealing with the hard stuff, I've been pain free. Yeah. So it's finding healthy ways to... Yeah, to kind of catch those thoughts, I suppose, before they become these hard feelings and deal with them. Mm. And we can talk about that a little bit more in a second, how we catch these thoughts. Mm. Uh, but also finding healthy ways to, once you've already got the feeling of processing them and expressing them. You know, these hard thoughts and these hard feelings don't only start to have physical consequences they also start resulting in behavior because mm. the next step in this chain is thoughts lead to feelings and feelings lead to our behaviors right. and so for many of us in this relationship with ourself uh, so we're having these hard conversations we're saying these unkind and mean things to ourselves. they're bringing up these really horrible feelings and then they start to result in really mean and unkind behaviors towards ourself as well uh, and that's when they become particularly dangerous and to other people. And to other people. I mean, if I look at how the Kindness Can movement started for me, it was a comment that my mom made. And uh, it was a really hard day because she she literally in one sentence knocked the wind out of my lungs. And she said to me, I got home and I was impatient and intolerant and just wound up and just not a very nice person. And she said to me, sometimes I feel like your listeners get the best of you. Wow, and I was like, so hard to hear. But it was true. So you know, hard to hear. I'd arrive every day with my best intention for being a, a portal for compassion and love and patience and kindness and effervescent and tolerance, yet I was doing none of that at home. And my most sacred people in my whole yeah. entire world were getting not even scraps. It was unkind. Mm. And I realized in that moment that... We all have a choice to either bow down to the triggered learned behavior or use that one and a half second to say, am I being kind and act accordingly? Yeah. It has literally changed my life. Sure. So as I mean, we're talking about having a relationship with ourself um, and so self-talk, the conversations that are happening inside of our head are the basis of that relationship. So it's about becoming intentional, active participants in this relationship with yourself, not just allowing your brain to run free. Mm. Uh, and I think what you're describing there is such a powerful part of that is slowing a moment down 
Okay, catching the thought, catching the feeling, catching the behavior, and stepping back from it and being like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm. I don't just have to be on automatic mode here. Mm. I can do something different. I can have a different thought, which might lead, in a, uh, lead to a completely different feeling, or I might choose a different behavior in this moment that's going to have better consequences to me and my life and the people around me. So it's about learning how to, to become more active in this relationship with ourselves. I think what's really enlightening for me is like I'm turning 40 this year. I know, right? <laughs> and 40 and gorgeous. Yay, Yay. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but what's really um, quite um encouraging for me is the older I get, the more opportunity I get to see how this could play out if I act in one way and how this can play out in another way before it's even happened. Yeah. So it's almost like preempting. Wonderful. Wonderful. So that's you being active in this relationship with yourself. You're participating in it. You're not just allowing it just to be. Um, we talk about the sushi conveyor belt. And so how our brain just ticks over, like our heart and our lungs uh, beat and breathe without us even knowing. And our brain's doing the same thing. So it's like a conveyor belt of sushi, just these thoughts going round and round and round. I love sushi. Uh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got to be more conscious about the piece of sushi that we choose to take off the conveyor belt and we choose to have as ours. I think many of us are in a, in a habit of choosing that same piece of sushi, okay, and it looks so delicious and tempting. Uh, but when we take it off, we know it's really bad for us. It's that thought of, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I'm never going to amount to this, that piece of sushi. And it's about being able to say, you know what? I know you. I know this automatic thought. I know this default. But in fact, today I'm going to put you back on that sushi conveyor belt and I'm going to wave you goodbye. Yeah. And I'm going to choose a new thought today about myself. And I'm going to let that be the basis of my feelings and, and my actions. And that's a very powerful thing to get into the habit of doing. So if someone's listening now and they're like, well, how do I even begin? How do I even begin putting into action a relationship with myself? Yeah. So... We talk about the three C's, uh, which I think is quite a powerful model, uh, which is catch. So catch the thought, put it in the palm of your hand. The second C, confront it, talk back to it, right? In this confrontation, you want to ask questions like, are you true? Are you useful? And are you kind? And in so many situations, we realize that this thought is not true. This thought is not useful because it's making me feel bad about myself. And it's not kind. I wouldn't say this to my friends. I wouldn't say this to my children. My goodness, why am I saying it to me? Mm. And then change it. Replace it with something new. Catch the thought, confront it, and change it with something new. And I use the example of, of kids who come home and say, Mom or Dad, I've got no friends. No one likes me. And then we, we challenge that thought with our kids. We say to them, but that doesn't sound true because yesterday you were playing with so-and-so and, -so and you've got a play date this weekend. So this idea that you have no friends, that's not a true thought. And it's only making you feel bad about yourself right now. A better way of looking at it is maybe I had a bad day and I felt a bit lonely, mm -hmm. but that was just today. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow I can try again. So it's reframing, reshaping uh, some of those thoughts. I think affirmations also are a really powerful way of nurturing a better relationship with ourself. So every now and then in your day, slowing it down and popping a, a new thought of your creation, of your making into this conveyor belt of sushi. Mm -hmm. So a thought like, I am enough. I deserve happiness. Uh, I am a good enough person uh, in this world. Something like that. Yeah. I also think what's really important is making sure that you surround yourself with the right people. Yeah, sure. Because I think in this day and age with social media being, you know, so accessible that it can get to you in those most vulnerable spaces at two in the morning when you can't sleep. So you climb onto Facebook ah, and then there's that comparison gosh, of I know that smoke moment. and mirrors and yep. stalking someone that you haven't, you know, I don't know, whatever yeah. the situation is. And it's <laughs> it's not fueling that, that kind space. No. So I really also think that it's important to seek the validation of people that you respect. You're not going to always win the brownie points and the claps from everyone, but that's also okay. Yeah. So surround yourself with people that want to see you do well in your life. So this is moving away now from the way where we catch the thoughts to sort of catching our behavior in the cycle uh, and making more conscious choices about what we do and in particular where we put ourselves. So surround yourself with people who, who clap for you, who support you. 
and unfriend and unfollow um, and stop putting yourself in rooms with people who who don't make you feel good about yourself. I think also a big part of this this journey with self is gratitude. Mm. Since I've really been practicing the art of gratitude, I can't tell you the fruit-bearing joy that it's brought into my life. Mm. And especially when raising children and trying to steer away from the sense of entitlement, but rather to just be fueled by immense and really like resonant gratitude. Yeah. So there's so much research coming out, uh, neuro research coming out, which suggests that when we replace those default negative thoughts with thoughts of, of gratitude, we can change the neuro pathways, which change uh, the way that we feel and act in the world. But it takes practice. Mm. It doesn't just happen easily because your brain is so tempted because it's trying to keep you alive to want to gravitate to that negativity bias. But we, gotta, we can, because we have consciousness, we can redirect uh, that process. And I think popping in affirmations of gratitude or, or thoughts around gratitude is a very, very powerful way of balancing things out. Yeah. And, you know, Paul and I never want to seem like we preach from an ivory tower. And so much so that I was the girl that was so depleted emotionally and physically and spiritually uh, at one stage of, you know, rearing three children under the age of two and, you know, coming and promising myself that whenever I came to work, I would be effervescent and joyous because, you know, stepping into a radio studio and connecting with people is such a special part mm -hmm. of, of my calling and my life and my love language. Um, but there have been some really tough days. And I have been the girl that's been on uh, serotonin replacements to try and make me feel happier. I am the girl that's been physically under it because I've manifested such sadness and worry into my shoulder. And I'm here to tell you that... It is a, a journey that requires some sort of discipline to kind of prioritize yourself, but it's totally doable. Yeah. And I now look back on my life where I don't live in pain. I don't live in fear. I used to have such bad moments of fear in my life that I used to taste metal in my mouth. It was almost like I could taste the feeling of fear. And I don't have that anymore. I don't take medication to help me deal with the peaks and troughs and the peaks and the troughs. And it's because I have honestly and truly stepped into a life fueled of gratitude and seeking the silver lining always in every situation. And it's, it's, it goes back to being kind, you know. It's very easy to be kind when things are going well. It's another story when things are falling apart and you have to now practice. Yeah. And it's with everything. It's going there. You're going to have moments where you think this is hard. This is really, really hard. But I promise you now, when you get into the cycle, it gathers momentum. And that momentum is, it's, is joy. Yeah. And the absolutely crucial word in what you just said there is is practice. You and I are so lucky that we get to do this work every day. Oh, um, and we get to have conversations with people as they try to uh, yeah, navigate some of the hard things in their life and, and nurture a better relationship with themselves and, and others. But what I'm constantly reminded of through that work and, and even in my own life, so I hear it all day, uh, but I'm still getting it mixed up sometimes, mm. is that practice. So I hope everyone who's listening will, will take encouragement from that, that it takes practice and this doesn't just happen simply. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong yeah. and that's a great moment to, to try again because you deserve it. You absolutely deserve it. You would give that uh, 100% in your other significant relationships. And so why not do it in your own relationship with yourself? Yeah. You're not alone, and we're here. So if you'd like to connect with us, uh, you can go to www.kindnesscan.co.za. Paul and I really are on such a passionate mission to take uh, the message of kindness and facilitation and tools into spaces like schools, uh, into corporate spaces, as well as into communities. Yeah, we look forward to connecting with you all. Chat soon. Lots of love. You've been listening to Kindness Can, the podcast. Find out more at kindnesscan.co.za.